Today, we're going to continue our series on the 1889 Fundamental Principles, and we're going to continue into the second fundamental, the second part of the second fundamental, which is on Jesus Christ. Now, this is the third week of reviewing these biblical fundamentals that Ellen White said made us Seventh-day Adventists. And really, at the heart of things, we need to understand what constitutes someone who is a true Seventh-day Adventist. And Ellen White noted uh, 129. Ellen White noted in manuscript 129 of 1905 the following, and I've read this the last couple weeks, but I'm going to read it one more time at least. It says, After the passing of the time, God entrusted to his faithful followers the precious principles of present truth. These principles were not given to those who had had no part in the giving of the first and second angels' messages. They were given to the workers who had had a part in the calls from the beginning. So she says here that these were precious principles of present truth. And then in the next paragraph, in paragraph 6, she says, Those who passed through these experiences are to be firm as a rock to the principles that have made us Seventh-day Adventists. And so today, friends, I'm, I'm just so thankful, so exceedingly thankful that I can be a true Seventh-day Adventist because I want to adhere to those principles of present truth that God gave to our people. The spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus, if, if you please, it states that it is being as firm as a rock to these principles that constitutes a true Seventh-day Adventist. Now, this is from a manuscript 129 that was written in 1905. But again, what does she mean in 1905 by these principles? How would we best understand those principles? Well, we could simply look at the principles, the fundamental principles that the, the church believed and taught at that time. And they were teaching things that were, they were in great unanimity on. In 1872, the first formal statement of fundamentals was published by the church. But that was revised slightly in 1889. It was mostly upgraded to add three additional statements that they felt were important to add in. And then they begin this statement by stating the following. Seventh-day Adventists have no creed but the Bible, but they hold to certain well-defined points of faith for which they feel prepared to give a reason to every man that asketh them. The following propositions may be taken as a summary of the principal features of their religious faith upon which there is... So far as we know, entire unanimity throughout the body. And they believe, and then they enumerated these 28 fundamentals. Now notice they say that there is entire unanimity. In other words, there's not a variance on this. You didn't have a group of people who believed in keeping the feast and a group of people who didn't believe keeping the feast. You didn't have a group of people who believed in keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath like the Jewish people did, per, per time, for instance, versus people who kept a lunar Sabbath. There was no difference among the people in these fundamental principles. And Ellen White says these are the fundamental principles that make us Seventh-day Adventists. And so we need to understand these principles. We want to examine them and look at them and see how we can apply them to our lives. We want to understand them from God's viewpoint. And the first of those fundamentals deals with the Father. We went through that two studies ago. The second one deals with the Son. And we went through the first part of it last week, and I'll just read it again, the first part of it. But we're going to go on and look at the second part today. But it begins by saying that there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of the Eternal Father, the one by whom He created all things and by whom they do consist, that He took on Him the nature of the seed of Abraham for the redemption of our fallen race, that He dwelt among men full of grace and truth, lived our example, died our sacrifice, was raised, for our justification. In this first part, we see Jesus, again, as the Son of the Eternal Father. He is the Creator of all things. We see His incarnation brought into view. We see His perfect life of obedience uh, to God. And then it speaks about His death on the cross and then His resurrection. Now, in the second portion of the statement, as it continues, we read about this, that He ascended on high to be our only mediator in the sanctuary in heaven, where through the merits of his shed blood, 
He secures the pardon and forgiveness of the sins of all those who penitently come to him. And as the closing portion of his work as priest, before he takes his throne as king, he will make the great atonement for the sins of all such, and their sins will then be blotted out, Acts 3.19, and borne away from the sanctuary, as shown in the service of the Levitical priesthood, which foreshadowed and prefigured the ministry of our Lord in heaven. And they say, see Leviticus 16, Hebrews 8, 4, 5, 9, 6, and 7. And so the first part of this statement deals with Christ as our only mediator, that he ascended on high to be our only mediator in the sanctuary in heaven. Now, we just need to stop before we go too much further and, and just think about a principle here. You can't be a mediator of just one. God is one, but you have to have two parties to mediate between. And the only way that you can mediate between those two parties is if you understand them each perfectly. And Christ, being the Son of God, understands divinity perfectly. Being the Son of Man, He understands humanity perfectly. But if Jesus was the second person of a single being called the Trinity, he could not be our mediator because then he would be having to try to mediate between himself and the people. And you can't do that. By very definition, you can't do that. It just doesn't make sense. But we see Jesus here now as our mediator. And we see him ascending to heaven to be the only mediator and our high priest. And so what we said was at the beginning of this series that we were going to be looking at these principles and finding Bible verses that substantiate these principles and help us to understand them. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, we have a very fundamental text to this principle of fundamentals. And there in 1 Timothy 2, 5, Paul writes, For there is one God, and we've read that in other places, haven't we? But it says also, And one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. In the fundamental, the pioneers of Adventism believed that there was one mediator and only one mediator, not two, three, four, or five. Why would they believe that? Because that's exactly what the Bible says, that there's one mediator, and that one mediator is between God, referring to God the Father and mankind. Jesus can't be a mediator between himself as part of a trinity and humanity. Now, the term mediator here in, in this verse is from a Greek word, mesites. And mesites comes from mesos, and mesites means an arbitrator or a mediator. But interestingly, meso, that it comes from, is a word that means middle or in the midst. So as a mediator, he's someone who's, as, it, as you were, in the middle. In fact, mesos, I want to show you a couple places it's translated in the scriptures. One is in John chapter 1 and verse 26. John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. And that's mesos. That's the word that we can translate middle. In other words, he says there's one standing right in the middle of you. And you don't even know who he is. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 18, Now this man purchased a fill with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. That word midst is mesos. And this is speaking, of course, of Judas, isn't it? But Christ is the middle man. He is, as it were, a daysman. Now, the word mediator is not found in the Old Testament. But there is a word that we translate that has an equivalence, and it's daysman, the daysman in Job. And we want to look at just some of the texts from the Bible that speak about Christ being our mediator. Now we saw that one in 1 John chapter or 1 Timothy rather chapter 2 and verse 5. But now we're going to look at some text in the book of Hebrews. And this is one of the reasons the book of Hebrews is so important to us as a people because it presents the high priestly ministry of Christ and his intercession for us in a way that really no other book of the Bible does um, except through typology. But in turn to Hebrews chapter 8 and we're going to begin in Hebrews uh, chapter 8. So if you would turn with me to Hebrews chapter 8, and I'll start in verse 1. It says, Now are the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. 
we have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man has somewhat also to offer. Who is the this man? Who is the high priest that Paul is speaking of here who is ministering in the sanctuary in heaven? Jesus Christ. And going on to verse 4 and 5 now. It says, For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for, see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern shewed to thee in the mount. And now verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is what? The mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. The old covenant was established upon the promises of the people. All the Lord has said we will do. In their weakness they thought they could serve God, but they couldn't. But here we have a better covenant. It's established upon better promises. It's established upon the promises of God. Hebrews 9, 11 through 13. But Christ, being come an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, continuing in verse 14 now, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your what? Conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Now before I go to verse 15, just keep in mind, friends, it's not the purification of the flesh that we need right now. When Jesus comes, this which is mortal will become immortal. That which is decayed, those who have died before, will, be, will become incorruptible. What we need to have purged right now is our consciences. We need to have our minds, our spirits cleansed. And he says in verse 15 now, And for this cause, so that all this might be accomplished, for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For this cause. So here it speaks about that he is the mediator of the New Testament. We read earlier that he was the mediator of the New Covenant. But remember the, the words covenant and testament in your New Testament, they come from the same Greek word. They mean the same thing. They have the same idea. Going on in Hebrews chapter 12 now. If we could turn over a page probably to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 and 23. He says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and into the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of judge, just men made perfect. Verse 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Abel's blood was shed. Abel had a sacrifice. He shed blood. But here's something that speaks even better than all of that. The shed blood of Christ. And he gives us now a warning. In verse 25, See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Friends, in the earthly service, if you turned away from those principles, you would be lost. You, you wouldn't have salvation. But friends, how much more important if we turn away from the one in heaven to the great high priest in heaven who mediates for us, for us there'll be no pardon for us. And in fact, the next part of the statement, besides him being our mediator, the one that we can go to God through, this is why we pray to God through Christ, because he's our mediator. He's our daysman. But 
The statement, the fundamental statement also said that he secures the pardon and forgiveness of the sins of all those who penitently come to him. He is, if you please, our absolver. We don't need to go to a Catholic priest or any kind of priest, confess our sins to that person and ask for forgiveness. You know, the, the, the Catholic Church has allowed a little bit of the English come into some of the services, but it used to be you, you would go to confession and you would confess your sins to the priest and he would say in the Latin, ego tu absolvo, which means I, absol I absolve you I, or I forgive you. But friends, Jesus Christ is the only mediator. He is the only one who died. He is the only one who rose again. And He is the only one who ministers in heaven for us. He is the only one who can provide the forgiveness that we need. We need forgiveness, friends. We need pardon and forgiveness. Now, is there a slight difference between forgiveness and pardon? Think about this for just a minute. If someone is pardoned, have they committed a crime? Oh yes, they, they've committed a crime for sure because you can't get pardoned without having already committed a crime. But that doesn't fix whatever happened. If, someone, if, if, if I shoot someone and I'm put in jail for murder and then 10 years later, 15 years later, the governor pardons me, it doesn't fix what happened before, you see. People may still have hatred and animosity toward me for what I did. Jesus wants to both pardon and forgive us. And for this to happen, there has to be something called mercy. There has to be something called mercy. Now, I've heard this story from a couple different angles, but I think I maybe tracked down the original story to this. And it's, it's told by the historian Shelby Foote. And he's talking about uh, Robert Lee, Robert E. Lee. And of course, Lee was greatly loved by his, his men. Uh, they just loved Robert Lee. Uh, but, but Lee could have a temper at times. In fact, a lot of times Lee had a, a very te hard temper. And said, he said he, he fought with it all of his life to try to, to cure it, you know. But one day, one of his soldiers was found in great disobedience. And he was brought before Lee and trembling. And, and Lee said to him, he says, just, just relax, son. It's okay. I'll make sure you have justice. And the soldier said, that's, that's not what I need, sir. He said, I'm, I'm guilty as can be. What I need is mercy. <laughs> I need mercy. Well, friends, we're all guilty as we can be. We are all guilty. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. What we need is forgiveness and pardon both today. But let's think about this text for just a minute. I want to look at a word in it. You probably never have looked at it too closely before. Maybe you have, and if you have, good. But it's 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. And I've highlighted one of those words here in the text, if you see it on the screen at least. It says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now that's a great promise, isn't it? It says that if we confess those sins. And sometimes when we think of confession, you know, we have a very shallow conception of confession. But sometimes if we understand the original language a little deeper than the surface, it can be a great benefit to us, and it is in this case. And so I have several Greek grammar books and uh, references that I can access. And in trying to look at many of these verses, I, I will look at the various words and, and comments that Greek scholars have made on these things to try to find extra insight. And I think I just found a real jewel on this one. And uh, this is from Kenneth West's um, Word Studies in the Greek New Testament. And I've broken it into three different slides here so that we get it all on the screen without making it so small. But West says this, and I'm quoting from West. Now John instructs the saints what to do about sins in their lives. The we includes John here. And it would seem that he is speaking of believers, for in other places he gives directions to the unsaved as to what they must do with relation to their sinful state and their sins. The sinner is to believe, John 3.16. The saint is to confess. And then West says, the word confess is homo logo, from homos, meaning the same, and lego, to say. Thus, to say the same thing as another, or to agree with another. 
West continues, Confession of sin on the part of the saint means, therefore, to say the same thing that God does about that sin. To agree with God as to all the implications of that sin as it relates to the Christian who commits it and to a holy God against whom it is committed. That includes the saint's hatred of that sin, his sense of guilt because of it, his contrition because of it, the determination to put it out of his life and never to do that thing again. This is what confession of sin means here. Does that seem to expound on it a little more than maybe you thought about it before? It, it helped me. He says, the English word confess means to admit the truth of an accusation, to owe up to the fact that one is guilty of having committed the sin. But the Greek word means far more than that, as was shown above. The verb is present subjective, speaking of continuous action. This teaches that the constant attitude of the saint toward sin should be one of a contrite heart, ever eager to have any sin in the life discovered for him by the Holy Spirit, and ever eager to confess it and put it out of the life by the power of that same Holy Spirit. And that's from West Word Studies in the New Testament, in the Greek New Testament, volume 13, page 104. You know, we, 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 we think about confessing sin in the common sense, as he says the English portrays. And sometimes we say, well, you know, you've got to confess that sin, but you also got to forsake that sin. But if we really understand what confession means here, it involves the forsaking of it. It involves the hatred of that sin just as much as God hates it. To be thinking just alike. To be speaking about it just alike as God does. I hope that adds a little bit to your depth of thought on that. Christ is the one who makes the atonement for us. The statement goes on to say, and as the closing portion of his work as priest, before he takes his throne as king, he will make the great atonement for the sins of all such, and their sins will then be blotted out, Acts 3, 19. Now, this word atonement in English it's, it's, it's a word that's sort of unique to English. You don't find the same word in, in French or German or Spanish or Portuguese in those languages. They don't have this word atonement. Most of them use a word that means to expiate or something similar to that. In English, we sort of break this word down. We say, well, it means at one minute or it means to be in harmony with, uh, with God. It comes, the Hebrew word that we translate atonement comes from uh, or is kafar, and it's um, it's used 89 times in the Old Testament, and um, I've got the very first place it's used here in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 14. God said to Noah, "Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch." But it, but it means to cover. This word literally means to cover, to cover. But keep in mind that the Hebrew language is a concrete language that does not easily express abstract ideas. Is forgiveness an abstract idea? You know, you can't put your hands on forgiveness. You can't mold it, shape it, tell, tell you what color it is or anything like that. It's an abstract idea. And so this, this verb meaning to cover is, is, is the word that God has chosen to use to convey this to us. It's also translated purged, for example, in Proverbs 16, 6. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, kafar, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. That's the same word that we translate atonement. In Daniel 9, 24, a text you should be familiar with. If you're not, you should be. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity or a covering for sins and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Kafar is translated pardon in 2 Chronicles 30.18. It's translated forgive in Deuteronomy 21, verse 8. 
It's translated merciful in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 24. It's translated cleansed in Numbers 35 and verse 33. Usually it's translated atonement or something like that, but there are some of these places where we see that they have put various usages to it. And in fact, now there's another word, a Hebrew word, that you're probably familiar with. And it's used in Leviticus 23 and verse 22. And it's actually the plural form of kafar is kippur. Kippur. Have you ever heard of yom kippur? Yom is the Hebrew word for day. It's the day of atonements. It's a plural word, the day of atonements. And in Leviticus 23 and verse 28, it says, And ye shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement, kippur. To make an atonement kafar for you before the Lord your God. So it could actually be translated, it is a day of atonements to make an atonement for you before the Lord. Now this is speaking about the day of atonement that you read about in Leviticus 16. Why would they, why would Moses put a plural usage of this word here instead of the singular? Because just like in the word Elohim, which is a plural, it shows the majesty of plural or the, the greatness of what it's speaking about here. In other words, this atonement, the Day of Atonement, is the atonement of all atonements. It is the great atonement. The great atonement. Now, keep in mind that it says that Jesus makes atonement for us. And Adventism historically taught what we would simply call a dual atonement, a dual atonement. And that is that when Jesus died on the cross, he made an atonement for his people. But it wasn't the only, it wasn't the complete or final atonement to be made, but that he would go to heaven in 1844, he would enter into the most holy place, and there he would make what is described as the final atonement. The question is, do we find this concept in the scriptures? Because that's what we're trying to appeal to, right? We're trying to appeal to the scriptures. Well, I would encourage you to look in Leviticus chapter 4 now. In Leviticus chapter 4, we have the sin offering delegated out. And the sin offering was actually categorized into four different types of sin offering, uh, depending on who it was that was sinning. There was a, a sin offering for the whole congregation when all the whole congregation sinned. There was a sin offering for the high priest. And then there was a sin offering for all the rulers and the common priests. But then you come down to people like us, just the common people. How did they deal with the common people? Well, in verse 27 of Leviticus 4 here, uh, Leviticus 4 verse 27, it says, If any one of the who common people sin through ignorance, why he doeth somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done and be guilty. And then it in verse 28, it begins to describe what we're going to do. There's going to be a, a sacrifice. They're going to be shedding the blood. But now going to verse 29, it says, And he shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering, and slay the sin offering in the place of the burnt offering. And the priest shall take the blood thereof with his finger, and put it upon the horns of the altar of burnt offering, and shall pour out all the blood thereof at the bottom of the altar. And he shall, verse 31, And he shall take away all the fat thereof, as the fat is taken away from off the sacrifice of peace offerings, and the priest shall burn upon the altar for a sweet savor unto the Lord, and, and what is the result of doing all this? And the priest shall make an atonement, kafar, for him, and it shall be forgiven him. It says that the priest makes an atonement for him. Now, this represents this sacrifice at the brazen altar, it represents Jesus dying on the cross of Calvary for us. And it says there, there is an atonement made, and it is an atonement of forgiveness. In other words, I can come into a relationship with God so close that He will look upon me as if I have never sinned. And He can forgive me and give me pardon. But this is not the only atonement the Bible speaks about. The Bible speaks about two different services, two great atonements. One is for forgiveness, but the other, friends, is for something else. And we're going to read about that now. 
But now I want you to notice what it says in Leviticus 16 about the effect of the Day of Atonement services. We won't take time to look at every detail of that. We don't have time today. But I want you to notice what the resulting effect of the Day of Atonement was. Leviticus 16.30 For on that day, for on that day, shall the priest make an atonement for you. Now we read about the sin offering, that the priest makes an atonement, right? But now here's an atonement being made on the Day of Atonement. Notice though the difference. That ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. He wants us to be clean. Is there a difference between being forgiven and being clean? I've often used the, an illustration of my daughter. When she was young, we were going somewhere one day, and Mother had put on this really pretty dress on her and said, now don't you get dirty. And she wanted to go outside and play a little bit, promised she wouldn't get dirty, you know. But sure enough, she came, into, came to the door crying. She'd fallen in some mud, and she was just a mess, you know. It's okay, we still love you. We love you, it's okay. We forgive you. But she still got to get cleaned up, right? We come to Jesus just as we are. And we ask Him to forgive us of our sins, and He can do that. But friends, there's still, there's still dirt in us that we don't know about yet. There's still our, our tendencies to sin. There's still love for things that we don't even know about yet. I've talked to many people who came out of the, the rock and roll, the acid culture, and, and, and I, I think of one that you all know, and I won't mention his name right now, but you know him well. And, and he said, you know, when he first became a Christian, he said, I had a hair down to my, the back of my back, and you know, I was still you know, smoking dope and stuff, and I just didn't know that listening to all that rock music and, and, and doing those things was wrong, you know. But as soon as he found out, he changed, right? Amen. But you see, we have to get cleaned up. We have to get cleaned up. And the Lord wants us to get cleaned up. And he uses this dual atonement. He uses forgiveness and cleansing. And these, these relate simply to the theological terms justification and sanctification. Justification and sanctification. In other words, God has a whole process and the ministry of Christ is designed to complete the work that needs to be done in us. Just as deep and just as bad as the fall in Eden was, the restoration will be just as perfect and just as complete. And He wants to do that in each one of us. Now, it's, it's a fact that this is not taught in most Adventism today. And we might say that this goes back to the book Questions on Doctrine, where much of our sanctuary doctrine, much of the incarnation of Christ was repudiated. There they wrote, Adventists do not hold any theory of a dual atonement. That's Questions on Doctrine, page 390. And that emphasis is in the original. No, we don't believe in this at all. Now, you need to understand something about the book Questions on Doctrine for just a little bit. There was an Adventist by the name of Theodore Unruh, who was president of the East Pennsylvania Conference of Seventh-day Adventists at this time. And he was listening to some radio sermons by one of the more popular, largest radio preachers in the United States at that time, Donald Barnhouse, who was the pastor of a Presbyterian church in Philadelphia. He had this large radio ministry, large church. Not, not really maybe one of the first mega churches, but toward the mega church, you know, several thousand members though. And he wrote to Barnhouse commenting about how he thought that Barnhouse was was preaching such a good series on Romans concerning righteousness by faith. He thought, Barnhouse has got it down, this Presbyterian. And, and Barnhouse was just taken back by this. Well, this man's a Seventh-day Adventist. He's, well, we know these Seventh-day Adventists don't understand the gospel at all. Why would he be commending me? And anyhow, it eventually initiated some dialogue. And Andrew said to Barnhouse, well, maybe you really don't understand Seventh-day Adventists as you think you do. And Barnhouse had grown out, had grown up in California, fairly near Heldsburg area, and he was pretty familiar with a lot of Seventh-day Adventists and thought he understood them. But now here he's being challenged. Well, at this time, he has a young man who's a protege, and his name is Walter Martin. And Walter Martin is doing some research on Seventh-day Adventists because he's going to be writing a book about Seventh-day Adventists, classifying them as a cult, and here's why they're a cult. And so the idea was, well, maybe we should get together because you're doing this research and this will be a chance to have some first-hand research and find out if these people really are a cult or maybe they are Christians as they somehow claim to be Christians. And so for two years, 
over the space of two years, these conferences were held in 1955 and 1956. These evangelicals submitted questions that the Adventists answered back. And the main Adventists involved were um, Leroy Froome, Roy Ann Anderson, and um, besides Andrew, there was another one, and I'm, I, I'm sorry, I've lost his name right now, but I'll get it in a little bit maybe. But, but mostly it was Anderson and Froome, mostly. And so then they wrote out or put out answers, and Froome was the principal writer. And these answers eventually were edited down and came into the book, Questions on Doctrine. There's a picture of Barnhouse when he was younger. And so when, when these conferences were going on, um, these men basically lied. They just lied. I'm sorry to tell you, they lied. They said, look, Adventists, we don't believe those things. There was a time when a few of the people believed those things, but by large, the larger group of Adventists have never believed these things that you're accusing us of. And let me explain to you what we really, really believe. And they were trying to rewrite our faith. Now, Barnhouse published a magazine called Eternity Magazine at that time. And before the book Questions on Doctrine came out, he was sharing some about what was going on in these meetings. And so in the September 1956 edition of Eternity, he wrote this. It should also be realized that some uninformed Seventh-day Adventists took this idea and carried it to fantastic, literistic extremes. Mr. Martin and I heard the Adventist leaders say flatly that they repudiate all such extremes. And this is, these extremes are talking about the dual atonement. They're talking about the idea that Jesus is actually making an atonement now in heaven for us. This they have said in no uncertain terms. Further, they do not believe, as some of their earlier teachers taught, that Jesus' atoning work was not completed on Calvary, but instead that he was still carrying on a second ministering work since 1844, this idea is also totally repudiated. Neither Roy Allen Anderson, Leroy Froome, William Reed, who was the other man I, whose name I lost a few minutes ago, he was the field secretary for the General Conference, and none of them ever repudiated uh, Barnhouse's statement, ever. None of them ever said, no, he, he didn't get it right. Now, you should also understand something. Well, I'll come to that in just a minute. In Questions on Doctrine, we also read this. When, therefore, one hears an Adventist say or reads in Adventist literature, even in the writings of Ellen White, that Christ is making atonement now, it should be understood that we mean simply that Christ is now making application of the benefits of the sacrificial atonement He made on the cross. That He is making it Efficacious for us individually according to our needs and requests. So if Ellen White or an advanced writer, let's, let's say you pick up Uriah Smith's book, Daniel and Revelation, or looking into Jesus, and you read in there that he says Christ is making atonement now, they say, no, it doesn't mean that. It just means that he's making an application to the benefits of the atonement that was completed and finished and final on the cross. Also in questions on doctrine. By the way, I think, it's, I think it's repugnant to think that we can speak for Ellen White. To say that she said one thing but really meant another. How glorious is the thought that the king who occupies the throne is also our representative at the court of heaven. This becomes all the more meaningful when we realize that Jesus, our surety, entered the holy places and appeared in the presence of God for us. But it was not with the hope of obtaining something for us at that time or at some future time. No. No! Exclamation point, friends. I didn't put that in there. He had already obtained it for us on the cross. Well, friends, then how, how can it be glorious, the thought that Jesus is there doing nothing for us? Get real. I mean, you don't need a, a high IQ. You don't need anything beyond a third grade education to see through this. Now, in our fundamental beliefs that, and when I say our, in the Seventh-day Adventist corporate church's fundamental beliefs, in belief number 24 they state, there is a sanctuary in heaven. 
the true tabernacle, which the Lord set up, and not humans. It used to be men, but they changed it to humans. They want to make sure the women don't feel left out. Although the Bible says man. In it, Christ ministers on our behalf, making available to believers the benefits of his atoning sacrifice offered once for all on the cross. Does that sound like anything you heard just a few minutes ago? It's almost exactly the language from questions on doctrine. It does not state affirmatively that Christ is making atonement now. It doesn't do that at all. It just says he's making application of the atonement on the cross. Now that cross represented was represented by the offering we read about in Leviticus chapter 4. Let's connect the dots. That represent, was represented by the offering in Leviticus chapter 4, and that was an offering that provided what? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Justification. But it doesn't provide for an atonement of cleansing or sanctification. Now, a few years ago, I, at a general conference, I had a chance to talk to one of the high-ranking officials in the general conference, and he was very upset with some of these beliefs himself. Uh, although I'm sure a Trinitarian, he understood that this particular belief, number 24, had been really muddied up. And he said that, that when these fundamentals were first drafted by the, the theologians at Andrews, he says, you, you've heard of doublespeak. We've all heard of this idea. Doublespeak, you say something and it can mean two different things. He said, well, they were even better. He said, they did triple speak. They did triple speak. He said, they tried to write these fundamentals so that if you believed in the old time doctrine, you could read that and see enough of it to think, well, yeah, we still believe the old time doctrine. But if you believe the new views, like Froome and, and under, uh, Anderson and others were promoting, you could see that in it. And if you were somewhere in the middle, you could sort of see that too. So you could see whatever you were looking for in it. But friends, it's a denial of our fundamental central pillar in doctrine. Now, coming back to a point I said I would, I would address. The book Questions on Doctrine, the evangelical conferences that occurred the two years prior to it, none of those would have ever happened, could never have happened, if we had not first made a great concession to the evangelicals in the doctrine of God, i.e. the Trinity doctrine. If that had not come in among us, this never would have happened. Now, Roy Allen Anderson, writing in the Review and Herald of September 8, or 1983, wrote an article called Adventists and the Trinity. Advance in the Trinity. And I've actually got photocopies here of a few of the paragraphs for you. Notice what Anderson says. It starts out with a question. What do you folks believe about the Trinity? Was a question put to me some years ago by two gracious Christian gentlemen who came unannounced to the General Conference headquarters in Washington, D.C. It took only a minute to discover the purpose of their visit. Having been welcomed by the receptionists, they quickly were ushered into my room, which was the editorial office of the ministry magazine and the council room of the ministerial association. Most inquiries of that kind ended up there. Two gracious gentlemen. One of those gentlemen, we'll find out in just a minute who he was. Both men were, and interestingly, Anderson never says who they are. Both men were Christian college professors who had read much about Adventists, but all from detractors. And one of them was commissioned to write a new book about Adventist beliefs. However, they felt they should contact the headquarters to discover what we actually believe on points of vital interest rather than just quoting from others. Who do you think this one person was who was writing a new book about Adventists happened to be? Water Martin. It was Water Martin. Because remember, Water Martin, had, he had produced The Kingdom of the Cults, and now he's going to write a book about the truth about Seventh-day Adventists. And Water Martin was one of these two men. Here's a picture of Martin, for example. Anderson goes on to say, The answers to the earnest questions lengthened in the days of prayerful discussions. Our answers concerning the Godhead and the Trinity were crucial. For in some of the books they had read that Adventists were classed as Arians. That is, those who claim Christ was not one with the Father from all eternity, but was a created being. And of course, that's not a right rightful representation, but they said that it is crucial. Now, Water Martin tells this story also. Water Martin told this story also. 
But he added some details that Anderson left out. Because they were planning, they were already planning to have these lengthy days of discussion that, that Anderson mentions here. But Martin came into his office and he says, you do believe in the Trinity, don't you? Because if you don't, this all stops right here. In other words, these evangelical conferences, the resulting book questions on doctrine, none of this would have ever taken place except that we believed in the Trinity at that time. Just, if you could please, for the record, just for the record, remember, we read that Christ is a minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle, and the example and shadow of heavenly things on earth were just that. They were examples and shadows of what would happen in heaven. And why we are looking at these fundamentals from a biblical perspective, proving them from a biblical perspective, and, and later we will look into, in detail, the prophecy of Daniel 8.14. We'll look into that aspect of the ministry of Christ, and we'll go into that prophecy in detail. I want to, just for the record, share with you what Ellen White said about the final atonement. That she did not deny in a final atonement. That she did not mean something else. And this is just for the record. It's not to substantiate the statement of itself that comes from the scriptures. In early writings, on page 253.1, in early writings comes from the early time, right? As the priest entered the most holy once a year to cleanse the earthly sanctuary, so Jesus entered the most holy place of the heavenly at the end of the 2300 days of Daniel 8 in 1844 to make a what? Final atonement for all who could be benefited by his mediation and thus to cleanse the sanctuary. And friends, the only way the sanctuary is ever going to be cleansed is when we are cleansed. The only way the sanctuary can be cleansed is when we become cleansed first. In the book Great Controversy, on page 480, paragraph 1, again, she's appealing to the type and the antitype, the type and the antitype. And in the type, don't miss this, in the type, in Leviticus 16, please read Leviticus 16 again. Read verse 30 again. It doesn't say that he makes application of the benefits of the atonement of Leviticus 4. It doesn't say that. In the typical service, only those who had come before God with confession and repentance and whose sins through the blood of the sin offering were transferred to the sanctuary had a part in the service of the Day of Atonement. So in the great day of final atonement and investigative judgment, the only cases considered are those of the professed people of God. Again, she speaks about the final atonement. And then in Patriarchs and Prophets, on page 350. 7 and paragraph 5. The blood of Christ, why it was to release the repentant sinner from the condemnation of the law, was not to cancel the sin. It would stand on record in the sanctuary until what? The final atonement. So in the type, the blood of the sin offering removed the sin from the penitent, but it rested in the sanctuary until the day of atonement. Now, Barnhouse said that Froome and Anderson said to him, Look, there is a lunatic fringe who teaches otherwise. And so by saying that, he was saying that people like M. L. Andreessen were a lunatic fringe. Taylor Bunch is part of the lunatic fringe. Going back, A. T. Jones was part of the lunatic fringe. E. J. Wagoner was part of the lunatic fringe. Uriah Smith was part of the lunatic fringe. James White was part of the lunatic French. And the, probably the greatest scholar we ever had, John Nevin Andrews, he was part of the lunatic French as well. Well, I don't believe it for a minute. And I don't believe Ellen White was part of a lunatic French, and I don't think we need to reinterpret her writings. We can accept them just for what they say. They're pretty plain. Also in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 358.1, as in the final atonement, the sins of the truly penitent are to be blotted from the records of heaven, no more to remember or to come to mind, so in the type they were born away into the wilderness forever separated from the congregation. Again, she's linking type and antitype together. Show me, show me anywhere in the type where on the day of atonement, 
it said that we are simply making applications of the benefits of the atonement of Leviticus 4. Show me one verse, one line of verse. You'll never be able to do it because it does not exist. What it says is that there's an atonement and they will be clean. Friends, God is right now, through the great high priestly ministry of Christ, through his mediation, he is making a people who will be clean. There's this concept that has been sort of dubbed final generation theology that deals with God perfecting a final generation and doing something to that final ge generation he's never done to any other people. And this is a, 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 an eschatological philosophy that is hated by most of the theologians of the church today. They speak against it, they hate it, they don't want anything to do with it. But friends, this is exactly what the Bible is saying. It's saying that he's going to, have a, he's going to come back for a church without spot, wrinkle, or what? Any such thing. And he's going to do it because of the medi mediation of Jesus Christ. Friends, Jesus today, he offers both pardon and forgiveness to us. And he wants to cleanse us from all our sins. Right? 1 John 1, 9. It involves, this process of Christ, it involves both forgiveness, pardon, but also cleansing with it. He wants to clean us up. He wants to make us fit people. He wants, to be, he wants us to be clean for that wedding that's going to be taking place between him and his people. And I want to be clean for it, don't you? Just like if I was going to my daughter's wedding or someone's wedding that was important to me, maybe my own wedding, I'd want to be clean, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Well, friends, this wedding's far more important. It means everything in the world. So what do you say that we accept the mediation of Christ for what it is and all that it is? so that he can be the complete and perfect Savior that the Bible portrays him to be. Amen? Amen. Let's have closing prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for such a Savior as Jesus Christ. We see in his very his existence in life upon being the Son of Man, the Son of God, everything that's necessary through the the incarnation, through his life, through his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his mediation now, his uh, being the great atoner for us, the great one who pardons and forgives and finally cleanses us from all sin. Father, we want to have sin out of our lives. We want to be saying the same thing that you do about sin in our lives. We want to hate it like you hate it. We want it expelled like you want it expelled. We want to live righteously like you want us to live righteously. So, Father, help us to understand your love, that we will come to you and want to come to you and serve you with all of our heart, Father. And I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll be having the next presentation next week, and we'll be talking about the Word of God. You don't want to miss it. And until then, may God bless you lots and lots and lots.